Welcome to the range walkthrough of the G model range of Porsche 911s. I have done five other walkthroughs of the other 911 ranges and I'll put a link to the series in the description below and there's a pop out at the top of the screen too. A nice binge watch for you there. Like the last times, I've built a guide which shows you all the different models in the range and I will guide you through both the mainstream and ultra rare versions of the longest lived range of 911s. The one pager guide shows you the engine capacity of each model and how much horsepower each one has. So I hope that by the end of this, if you are looking for a G model Porsche 911, then you'll be better educated for your search and know which are the genuinely rare cars. This particular range is notable for a number of important 911 milestones, not least of which was the addition of the first ever convertible. And, of course, the venerable turbo model with its forced induction engines putting out incredible power for the time. We will look at all of these together as we go. It's rare to find one much below 40,000 US dollars these days, and frankly the sky is the limit for low mileage, good condition, rare models. We'll look at the pricing as we go too, through the range, so follow along and enjoy! So, starting at the beginning, the Porsche G model is the second generation of 911. It superseded the F series and was launched in 1974, finally being replaced by the 964 in 1989. Porsche itself saw lots of changes in that time, and by 1989 were facing a tough market in the days of recession. This was also supposed to be the last 911 range, as Porsche brought out the supposed replacement 928 in 1978. US regulations forced a change from the F models that preceded this range, impact bumpers were required to be fitted, and that necessitated a redesign of the front end of the 911. Porsche used this time to increase the engine size up to 2.7 litres, and fitted Bosch fuel injection to the new 911 and 911S models. Those are the first two models on our list then, the new 911 with 2.7 litres and 150 horsepower and the 911S with the same 2.7 litre engine but putting out 175 horsepower. In 1976 though, Porsche increased power of the 911 to 163 horsepower. Sitting alongside the 911 and 911S was the Carrera which was mechanically identical to the Carrera RS of 1973 and 1974 and, at the beginning, even had the RS rear flares. Outside the US, with their mechanical fuel injection engines, these cars put out a superior 210 bhp, whereas in the US, where emission regulations had taken a tight hold, the cars had continuous injection system engines. It was strangled to 173 bhp and to an even lower 160 bhp in California, making these models 25% less powerful than rest of world cars. That's a lot. 3 litre Carreras came along in 1976 and 1977, with slightly reduced power down to 200 bhp. Remember though, these cars were very light, weighing in at just 2,470 pounds, or 1,120 kilos. By today's standards, where 911s weigh between 3,200 and 3,700 pounds, this made for a pretty lively car, especially with the engine acting like a pendulum in the back. We will get to the Porsche 911 Turbo in a minute though. Continuing the theme of the US market being in the stranglehold of emissions concerns, for one year only in 1976, Porsche produced a four-cylinder version of the 911 called the 912E. You might recall this was not the first time they had done this, nor the last for that matter, and in this one they used the engine shared with the beautiful 914. The 924 came along in 1977 as a four-cylinder model in its own right, uh, and this car was discontinued. The 74 to 78 cars currently range between 35,000 US dollars and 135,000 US dollars. So much depends on condition and originality. Many cars have been resto modded, and why not? Whereas others remain in unrestored condition. The standard advice stands here buy the best you can afford and don't buy the cheapest. Staying with the base model of the 911 range though, by 1978 the 911, 911S and Carrera models were all replaced by the Carrera SC, or Super Carrera, which would run from 1978 to 1983, a long run indeed by Porsche standards. 
Again, US customers were treated differently to the rest of the world customers, receiving a 3 litre 180 bhp versus 185 and then 201 bhp for the later model rest of world cars. The SC cars were Porsche's move towards more luxury in their cars, as well as safety and emissions equipment. The SC is notable for two principal reasons. Firstly, it was supposed to be the last ever range of 911. Porsche brought out the 928 in the same year as the SC in 1978, but mercifully had decided in the 1980s to continue with it. And secondly, it was the first range of 911 to have a convertible. In the last year of SC models in 1983, Porsche gave us the convertible, a model which continues to this day. Porsche also gave us two special editions within the SC range, introducing us to their special wishes program, or in German, Sonderwunschabteilung. This department firstly put out the Weissach Special Edition in 1980, exclusively from the North American market, and only made 400 of them, 200 in black and 200 in platinum. In modern terms, you could think of these cars as the SC with an aero kit, as they all had a front spoiler and the whale tail from the turbo model. In 1982, the same department gave us the Ferry Porsche Edition, Again, 400 units, but not available in the US nor the UK, just rest of world markets. These models were cosmetically different to the standard SC and had Ferry Porsche's signature embossed in the headrests of the special fabric seats. Rare indeed, but not so special from a mechanical perspective. SC sales totaled just under 60,000 cars worldwide, and as far as buying one today is concerned, you should think 35 to 75,000 US dollars, dependent on condition. Moving forward, the SC was replaced by the 3.2-litre Carrera in 1984 and continued until the end of the G model in 1989. The 3.2-litre engine put out 207 bhp, rising to 217 bhp by 1989 in the US, whereas rest of world cars have the same 3.2-litre engine but were given 234 bhp for the life of the range. An engine that Porsche claimed was 80% new over the SC initially came with the same transmission as the SC. However, the desirable G50 gearbox transplanted that in 1987, making the post-87 cars the ones to look for. It was a significantly smoother gearbox to operate, making the drive smoother and easier to use. Externally and internally, the 3.2 Carrera is almost identical to its predecessor SC, except for fog lights built into the valance. A number of interesting options and special editions were given to us during this time. Let's start with the M491 option, or to give it its better known name in the UK, the Super Sport Edition. This came to market in 1984 and was popular in the US, where, since 1980, the 911 Turbo had been discontinued, more of which next. It had the T-Tray rear spoiler, suspension and wider rear end of the turbo whilst retaining the 3.2 litre engine of the Carrera, the turbo look. And next, in 1987, until the end of the run, came the Club Sport, a specially stripped out Carrera for club racing. Officially called option M637, the car mostly did away with air conditioning and pretty much all other power operated systems for a weight saving of 150 pounds. 340 units were built, with just 21 coming to the US, 8 to Canada and 53 to the UK. They are identifiable by their white paint and red Carrera CS decals on the sides. Very rare indeed and worth a pretty penny these days if you can find one. One was bid up to US dollars in August 2020 on auction website Bring a Trailer and failed to sell. Gives you an idea of what you might need to spend to secure one. These special editions keep on coming in the 3.2 Carrera range. To make the 250,000th 911, Porsche gave us the commemorative edition in 1988, another cosmetically special model, of which just 875 were made, with 300 of those coming to the US. And one year later, in 1989, to celebrate another milestone of 25 years of the 911, Porsche produced the 25th anniversary edition, Again, cosmetic specials with 500 coming to the US. And to round out the Carrera range, Porsche gave us option M503 in 1989, also known as the Speedster. Over 2,000 units produced and in wide or narrow bodies, although the narrow version was much rarer, as only 171 were made of those. 
the low roof version of the Carrera Cabriolet. You should probably think between $150,000 and $250,000 for one of those here in the US. So let's talk about the turbo. Porsche's first ever foray into the world of forced induction production cars hit the streets in 1975 with the 3 litre 260 bhp turbo 930 model. Remember, the standard 911 of the era put out 150 bhp, which itself was double the power of the average family car of the time. So this was a huge increase in power and a very fast car. A fast car that had quite some turbo lag too, which meant careful concentration was required on the part of the driver when increasing power in corners. For if too much throttle was given and remembering the pendulum effect of having the engine in the back, Lots of these cars became friends with the world's shrubbery and ditches, as owners were caught by surprise by the sudden onset of power, which unsettled the grip and balance of the car mid-corner. They are notorious for this reason. The car that defines the term snap oversteer. With its single turbo, these cars are distinguished by their new whale tails designed to ventilate the engine more effectively and create downforce. The 1978 model year gave us the 3.3-litre turbocharged engine and 300 bhp, as well as the T-Tray spoiler. One distinction every discerning 911 enthusiast should be aware of, and which I was quite rightly pulled up on recently in another one of my videos, is the difference between a whale tail and a T-Tray rear spoiler. So that you know this is a whale tail to be found on earlier cars, and this is a tea tray, generally found on later cars. Hope this helps. This car existed only until 1980 in the US and Japan, as emission regulations forced Porsche to withdraw the 911 Turbo 930 uh, from these markets. Could you imagine that happening these days? There would be an outcry. It returned in 1986 to those markets though, and as mentioned above, the Super Sport helped to appease would-be US Turbo customers as did the 928, which Porsche management hoped would become the new halo car in the range. Not to be, as we now know. From 1983, you could, if you were not in the US or Japan, option your car up to 325 bhp with the WLS option. This gave it a quad exhaust system and various other performance enhancing improvements. And from 1985, you could also order your turbo in cabriolet or targa forms too. Turbos from this era are very desirable as you can imagine. Dependent on condition, think 120,000 US dollars up to well over 200,000 US dollars for the best. Lastly for this walkthrough, let's look at the slant nose or flash bow turbos. These were produced under the Zonda Wunsch program or Special Wishes program from 1986 and were essentially the 930 turbo with the front slanted face of the 935 racing cars which were streamlined to be able to go faster. Very rare indeed, and when bought new, commanding a 60% price premium over the standard 930. Just 948 units were built, with 140 of them coming to the United States. The one that you are looking at here is from footage that I took in my guided tour of Black Horse Garage here in Connecticut, and is one of the US cars owned by a famous client of theirs. Watch that video for more information. The link is above and in the description below. So that's my walkthrough of the Porsche 911 G model range, which I hope was helpful. Stay tuned for similar films to come and have a look at my other 911 range walkthrough videos and others. Meantime, thanks a lot for watching. See you soon.